Um, welcome, everyone. Um, and thank you uh, for coming tonight. Um, it is difficult to uh, compete with the Giants playing in the World Series, uh, and so that's why we started early today. Uh, so I'm glad you could make it. Um, I am Professor Charlotte von Robert from the Taube Center for Jewish Studies. Um, my co-director, Vera Chemtov is not here tonight, but uh, so we are very happy to co-sponsor tonight's uh, lecture together with uh, religious studies. Uh, the chair, uh, Hester Gelber, Professor Gelber is sitting in the back, so thank you also for supporting this visit. Um, and uh, Humanities Center for the co-sponsorship. So it's my great uh, privilege to welcome uh, Professor Paula Fredrickson tonight. Um, her lecture tonight actually comes at the tail end of a two-week stay here on campus as a visiting professor in the Department of Religious Studies, where she has taught a mini-seminar on Jews and Christians in the in Judaism and Christianity in the Mediterranean world, on contact and conflict uh, to both uh, graduate students and undergraduate students. Uh, to some of you, she does not need introduction because we invited Paula for a few years ago for a lecture on, I hope you remember that, <laughs> on Mel Gibson's controversial Hollywood, Hollywood interpretation of the Passion of the Christ, which you can read about, read about in book form since she published a book on the Passion of the Christ, exploring the issues raised by the controversial movie. Uh, as an internationally recognized scholar of the historical Jesus, she also became an outspoken critic of Gibson's movie, and if you want to know why, you'll just have to read the book. Um, indeed, her roots to Stanford, which I found out only this time, her roots uh, in Stanford go back a few more years since her earliest, or one of her earliest teaching experiences began here at St Stanford in our department. Uh, and on this visit, we also dis discovered our common roots of the complicated Jewish lives that we both share in, in Berkeley. Uh, however, we invited uh, Paula for a different reason, which is that she has recently published a book on Augustine and the Jews, and my colleague, Professor Stephen Weitzman, uh, the new Koshland Professor on Jewish Culture and History in Bible and Second ba Temple, and I wanted, to, wanted her to come and teach, uh, teach our students, not just the books, but the, the text that led up to the books. So both Stephen and I are of the school of thought that it is not only the students of Christianity who need to study Judaism, which makes eminently sense when both Jesus and Paul are sons of that culture, but that it is students of Judaism also who need to study Christianity. And no one better than Paula, whose focus in her work is on Christianity's Jewish origins, uh, to pass out what that might mean. This beautifully written book on Augustine and the Jews is one where Paula returns to her first love, um, which came, I guess the first book that, you, that came out, that you published was uh, Augustine's, um, Augustine's Commentaries on the Romans in 1982. Um, and so the, the, the big book on Augustine and the Jews just came out in paperback version also. Um, so she bridges successfully the worlds of the trade press and academic press, or we could say um, the public and the ivory tower of the academy, since the Augustine book came out first in dub by Double Day, Double Day and then was published as paperback in Yale, and so other of her books were also published, both in, both in trade version and academic press. So Paula is a, is, is a wonderful version of what we would call a public scholar. Uh, professionally, um, she is, in theory, well, I guess still in practice also, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, holds a position at Boston University, formerly the William Goodwin Aurelio Professor of Appreciation of Scripture, long name for a chair, but now she's an emerita of this chair because she went on a, a, a leave from Boston University and is actually teaching at Hebrew University 
uh, classes on early Christianity every spring quarter. And so she shifts her professional life, her teaching life right now between Boston and Jerusalem and goes back and forth. So on this occasion, she came all the way from Jerusalem after organizing her middle daughter's wedding. So we are very pri privileged, and please help me to, uh, uh, to welcome Professor Fredrickson, who came all the way across two continents and one ocean to California. Thank you. And uh, I thank all of you. I mean, this is sometime between four o'clock and six o'clock is either carpool hour or nap time. So I really appreciate um, your coming here. I had inadvertently changed the title of this lecture in my own notes to Paul Pagans and the God of Israel, which I think is in your handout. The publicity for the lecture, which is in front of the podium, uh, talks about um, uh, Judaizing the nations. And what I actually am going to do, the, both of those ideas are going to be braided together in my presentation. Please don't be anxious at the fact that you're staring at four single spaces, single space pages of handout. Um, there will not be a quiz after the lecture. This is just so that when I say something, you don't have to wonder why I'm saying what I'm saying, but you actually have the primary sources uh, in your hand and so can follow me while I uh, try to reconstruct the argument I'm going to make. A peculiarity of the lecture will be that I'll be referring to Paul's, uh, the audiences for Paul's letters as pagans rather than Gentiles. And this is because there's only a single Greek word that stands behind both of our English words. Gentile means somebody who is um, not a Jew, but also not a pagan. And a pagan, of course, means somebody who is uh, worshiping traditional gods. But in antiquity, and especially for the first generation of the Christian movement, Gentiles are pagans and pagans are Gentiles. So I wanted to collapse the wiggle room that our two English words gives us so that you can have a more vivid appreciation of the cultural context and the existential context of the audience of Paul's letters. These people are pagans. Their gods exist, they know their gods exist, and they're dealing with their, their former gods is one of the things both they and Paul have to do um, as they make this transition into this radioactively apocalyptic moment in the evolution of what will eventually become Christianity. So we're talking about Paul, pagans, and the God of Israel. And uh, one last reference to my, this beautiful poster for the lecture. I hope you've all seen it. It has in it a fifth century mosaic of a zodiac. And if you had the chance to look at the images on the zodiac, you might have noticed something odd. The, uh, where you would expect Virgo, there's a young lady, and it says Betula, virgin, on it. And where there are two fish, Instead of Pisces, there are Dagim. So this is a, a, this is a Jewish zodiac, but of course the representations, the planetary and astral representations of the zodiac are gods. And this is something that's found on a synagogue floor. You could say, well, that's just what was on special for, um, by the contractor that year, but I don't think so. What I'm trying to get across to you is a sense of, even though we, for our analytic purposes, imagine these communities as distinct because we're trying to trace out what are pagans doing, what are Jews doing, what are Christians doing. In fact, life is lived cheek by jowl and shoulder to shoulder, particularly in Mediterranean antiquity, the period I'm talking about, the Hellen late Hellenistic and early Greco-Roman period. If you look in the middle of the first page of your handout, you'll see vaguely the, um, a quick timeline, just a chronological orientation. I'm not going to hit every single year in this presentation. In fact, most of the story will focus in around the year 50 with Paul's uh, mission and the letters we have from him. But the story really starts out with Alexander the Great. Because of Alexander the Great, Jewish scriptures are eventually translated into Greek, which is the English of antiquity. And if it hadn't been for Alexander the Great, and if it hadn't been 
for the translation of Jewish scriptures into Greek, which was the international frequency, in a sense, for communication, I don't know what we would all be gathered here in this room to talk about today, because really there, there couldn't have been Christianity if this moment of cultural and, and textual translation hadn't first occurred. So we're dealing in a world where there is a very vigorous Hellenistic, Hellenistic means imported Greek, imported Greek culture, Hellenistic urban culture, and this Hellenistic urban culture is the medium within which there is a flourishing Western diaspora Jewish community for centuries before we get to the career of the Apostle Paul. If you look at the very first section of the first page of your handout, you'll see some things in caps. These are sound bites that I think with when I am uh, orienting myself in this primary material, and I invite you to use them too as you track my argument in this lecture. The first is that gods run in the blood, which is to say, another way to put this, in antiquity, gods and the humans who worship them form family groups, spelled out at the bottom of the first page. Cult is really an ethnic and a family designation, and ethnic designations are cultic designations, which is the second point of um, those sound bites. In other words, not only is ethnicity encoded in cult for humans, but gods are also ethnic in antiquity. Gods are no less ethnic, and this is certainly true for the Judean god, the god of Israel, no less than uh, the gods of Rome, is the god of a specific people, and this is a principle that Paul holds to. And um, that's a thread we'll trace through his, um, through his letters. The third point I want to make is that ancient cities are religious institutions. Ancient cities are not secular spaces. They are large collectivities of humans. But the, the defense of the city and its well-being depends on its positive relationship with the gods who preside over the well-being of the city. A lot of urban culture, theater, competitions, athletic events, oratory, government, begin with animal sacrifices or incense to the gods who preside over the city. The goal of the city is to keep the gods happy, and the way they do that is, at my fourth point, through showing respect publicly through cult. Cult can mean blood offerings, but it also means any kind of offerings, including, uh, including prayer. Um, cult makes gods happy, and uh, the implication of this is a happy god makes for a happy city. If, if your god is happy, then you will probably be a happy human. Uh, the correlate is that unhappy gods make for unhappy humans, and we'll see Paul express this thought uh, when we turn to some of the excerpts I've made from his letters. Another point of anti in antiquity that is important for us to remember if we want to reimagine ourselves back into Paul's situation and the situation of his audience is that in antiquity, all gods exist. All gods exist. And one of the common sense empirical proofs that they exist is the existence of their individual people. So it's a God-congested universe. You are born into obligations to a certain god Please come, there are seats here. You're born into obligations to certain gods, and um, paganism, pagan culture, Hellenistic culture generally, was comfortable with showing respect to more than only the gods one is immediately obligated to, but one is immediately obligated um, to one's own gods, beginning with ancestors and family gods and going out to the level of the city and eventually with the Roman Empire to the uh, level of the empire. So what we think of as, um, as religion is, in a sense, ancestral custom. There is no word for religion in antiquity. Cult, more or less, functions the same way. But it's really you inherit the gods you worship, and you inherit the protocols by which you worship them. A uh, something very important to know in antiquity after, other than all gods existing, is that any god is more powerful than any human, which is another reason why you never want to get on the bad side of a god, anybody's god. 
if you can possibly avoid it um, in antiquity. And finally, a correlate of this, in antiquity, all monotheists are polytheists by modern definition. And I include ancient Jews in this, and I include Paul in this. In other words, just because a person, let's say a Hellenistic Jew, is committed to the worship of his own ancestral God according to the protocols he's inherited from his family and his people, it doesn't mean that he thinks that no other gods exist. That's a modern definition of monotheism. Ancient monotheism is messier than modern monotheism, and I'm going to illustrate how that's the case as we continue, um, as we continue this afternoon. So just uh, at the bottom of the first page, just illustrations about the relationship between, uh, between family or genos, a word that's translated as race or people or tribe. Uh, one's genos and a couple of definitions of uh, Greekness, which it's a combination of blood, language, and religion. Let me use the modern term. And Ju Judeanness or Jewishness, the Greek word is Juda Judaismos, also defined as, um, as sanctuary uh, city and religious and laws that are um, inherited. The idea of religions and, uh, and groups forming family units, um, this is a familiar thought for majority culture. Julius Caesar was related to Venus. Um, Hercules, I'm sorry, Hercules was one of the ancestors of several of the imperial uh, figures in this period. And also in Jewish culture, there is a family relationship imputed between God and not only the ruler, as you see from Psalm and 2 Samuel, but also between God and the people of Israel. Israel, are he describes them as his children or as his eldest son. And that's an idea that we find in Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans 9. If you look at Romans 9, 4 at the very bottom of the page, and you look up to item three, where Greekness is defined just above, you'll, you'll hear the resonances of the ways of defining these terms. Paul's kinsmen, that's what uh, that Greek word means, sugenes, are Israelites, he says, and to them belong the sonship. So Israel is God's son. The glory, and then that's the word in Greek, and then in he the Hebrew that sits underneath Paul's Greek, uh, kavod means God's presence. It's a reference obliquely to the temple in Jerusalem, which is where God's presence is. The covenants, the giving of the law, and the sacrificial cult. The word in the RSV is translated as worship, which is really too bloodless, um, a decision on the part of the translators. Lytreia is the Greek word for the Hebrew word avodah, and it, it means cult. So this is another reference to um, the temple cult. So Paul himself is defining his people by their, their traditional customs, their God. And notice he can't say language, common language, as an identifier of um, his people because his people speak Greek. Paul is, a, is um, a Jew whose first language is Greek. Well, I usually, and we're going to the second page now. This is where it gets fun. We all know that pagans thought there were other gods. That's what paganism is, is a lot of different gods. But the Bible also acknowledges the existence of other gods. And certainly, um, first century Jews like Philo of Alexandria and like Paul, the apostle, do as well. So um, I have two quotations, one from Micha, one from um, Exodus. The point about Micha is simply one of the many points you can I'm sure any of us can think of places in Psalms and so on where the gods of the nations are referred to. Once the text comes into Greek, there's an interesting acknowledgement on the part of the translators who are probably translating the Bible in Alexandria around minus 200, that the Greek gods, unlike the Canaanite gods, the Greek gods are embedded in urban culture. The Greek gods represent and preside over good Greek educations, which a lot of these Jews have. 
And so when they look at the Hebrew text for Exodus 22, 27, which says, do not revile God, into the Greek it becomes, do not revile the gods. Don't talk disrespectfully of the gods. Um, another verse I didn't put down here, but I'll mention Psalm 95, 5 in Greek says, the gods of the nations are daimones. It's the Greek word that becomes, obviously you can hear it, our English word demon, but a daimon in, um, in Hellenistic Greek is a lower god, a god who's literally not as high up in the universe as, as the high god is. It's a geocentric universe, and Earth is in the middle, and uh, the closer a god is to Earth, the less elevated he is celestially and cosmically. So calling the gods of the nations daimones is a way very nicely of uh, the Greek translator of Psalms to not only acknowledge the existence of these other gods, but to subordinate them to the God of Israel, since they, they, he's calling them lower gods, daimones. Philo of Alexandria, an elder contemporary of Jesus and of Paul, comments when he's uh, doing his commentary on Exodus, that reviling each other's gods always causes war. He's commenting on the verse in 22, 28 that says no, don't revile the gods. And the reason you don't do that is for peace. And he also says in the same passage that Jews should show respect for pagan rulers, quote, who are of the same seed as the gods. He also, when describing the creation of the universe, getting to the creation of stars and planets, calls the heavenly firmament, quote, the most holy dwelling place of the manifest and visible teoi, the manifest and visible gods. Not only in this uh, cosmic way and in, this, in, this, in the universe of biblical commentary do other gods show up, but other gods also figure in something called kinship diplomacy. In antiquity, different cities would enter into political treaties with each other by discovering that they had a distant ancestor in common, and usually this distant ancestor would be the product of two gods. And if you know your Greek mythology, you know that uh, Greek gods had a tendency to leave a trail of human children um, behind them, Well, the Jewish god didn't act like this. He did not have uh, human offspring, but Jews were still part of the diplomatic and political universe of Hellenistic antiquity. And what we have in the book of the Maccabees, um, it's book 12, I think I made a note to me. Yeah, it's in book 12, I'm sorry, uh, book one of the Maccabees, chapter 12. It's also reported, the same tradition is reported in, in Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews, book 12, is that Spartans and Judeans are one genos. They're one race or one tribe because of a distant common ancestor that was born from, it's not clear if it's a marriage or just a date, but Hercules, goes out with one of the granddaughters of Abraham. There's no comment made either in the Antiquities by Josephus or by the author of the Maccabees. There's no comment on the fact that Abraham's granddaughter um, was dating a non-Jewish chatan. But this is, this is a Jewish diplomatic tradition that's in no, no less patriotically Jewish a book than um, Maccabees, which is, I'm trying to give you a sense of how realistically these gods impose upon how people live their lives in the Hellenistic Mediterranean. Uh, finally, two uh, quotations from Paul's letters, First and Second Corinthians. Paul says in First Corinthians, although there are many go so-called gods in heaven and on earth, and indeed, there are many gods and many lords, and he's talking to his pagans in Corinth, yet for us, there is only one God, the Father, so he's not saying to these pagans, get with the program, your gods don't exist. What he's saying is, yeah, yeah, I know that there are lots of other gods, but I want you to worship only my God, who is the highest God, says 
says Paul. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he mentions, and we'll get back to this verse again, that the God of this cosmos, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Paul not only knows that these other gods exist, he is suffering from their effects. And we'll find out why these other gods are hassling Paul uh, in the course of this lecture. This acknowledgement of the gods of other nations did not extend in general to sacrificing to the gods of other nations. Jews in general, and we know about this partly because of pagan complaints that Jews aren't pulling their weight in terms of taking care of the cities where they live. Jews don't do Lytreia. They don't do cult to foreign gods in principle. Nonetheless, there are many other ways of showing respect. And this is a Mediterranean culture. And being shown respect and being seen to show respect matters um, a great deal. And what you have here in this next section is the is the acknowledgment that we have in different inscriptions of Jews who are paying respect to the gods of the nations while not exactly, they're not uh, actually sacrificing to them. That would be out of line. But they are acknowledging them and being, uh, being respectful to them. And the first, um, the first example, this is from uh, minus third century. Moscos, who identifies himself as a Jew, Eudaios, frees a slave, quote, having seen a dream at the orders of the god Ampharos and Hygienia. Hygienia, just as you'd expect, is the goddess of, I think for her, is the goddess of dental floss. She's a goddess of cleanliness and good health. Uh, these two gods showed up in a dream to Moscus, who's a Jew, but he knows what these gods look like. Why? How does he know? How can he identify them when they show up in a dream? S statues. That's right. His city would be filled with statues of these gods. So he, they come to him, they say, you should free your slave. And when a god tells you to jump, the only correct response is, how high? So Moscos um, liberates his slave, as these gods asked him to do. And luckily for us, he did it in the temple of these gods and uh, left a, um, a votive message acknowledging this. And it got carved in stone which is why people uh, much later on uh, could find it and find out about Moscus's dream. This is the sort of thing you wouldn't expect to find in a biblical text, but you do find it in this, these other types of evidence that we have at the periphery and the sort of um, off-trail evidence that you can get from, uh, from inscriptions. Uh, there's another man, Nikitas from Jerusalem, who gave 100 drachmas to support a festival dedicated to the god Dionysus. Um, Herod the Great, who does a terrific job uh, rebuilding and refurbishing the temple in Jerusalem, also builds shrines to foreign gods, especially to the gods Augustus and Tiberius. Um, and he was also a patron of the Olympic Games, which are dedicated to Zeus. And finally, this is um, this, I think, is really interesting. There's an argument that goes on among scholars whether this is this inscription is by a pagan who hangs around a synagogue, or whether it's by a Hellenistic Jew who has a God-congested universe like most ancient uh, Jews do. The, this is an inscription for the freeing of a slave. It starts out with an invocation to the Jewish God, and it closes with an invocation to sky, earth, and sun under the, the Greek names of those gods. So you start out with the highest god, and you end with Zeus, Gaia, and Helios. There's a, there's a comfortable level of um, communication between these. And the, these gods are obviously lower than the highest god, which is the, the god of the Jews. And finally, item number five. Uh, education and city government and athletes in the theater. We have Jewish actors. We have Jews in the army. We have Jews as town counselors. In all of those places, while we don't have evidence for what they actually did, we know that they must have spent some part of their working day 
showing respect to gods that were not theirs, because that's what comes along with the responsibility of holding any of those positions. So those are, does this mean that these people are naughty Jews? No. It means that they are ancient Jews, which is what we would expect because we're dealing with antiquity here. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that there's a high degree of social integration of ancient uh, Jewish populations in the Western diaspora, but it exists together with religious, or to use a different term for the same idea, ethnic distinctiveness. Food would be, foodways would be a way to be ethnically distinct even if your day job was being a down, uh, town councilor. The next section of the handout is to show the permeability of Jewish community to the pagan majority culture. There are lots of practical arrangements that pagans, as pagans, make to show respect to the Jewish God. One of the first ways is uh, by going as a tourist to the temple. Herod's temple was enormous. He built, uh, he filled, he did landfill. He took the mountain and filled it in so that it's, a, it's like a mesa, and the wall around the exterior of the temple precincts ran for almost a mile, and within that, the largest court was the court of the Gentiles, or the court of the nations. And the court of the nations is where people who were on this tour of uh, temples in antiquity could stop by and show respect for the Jewish God, but they would be pagans as they were visiting, that nobody was making them convert to Judaism in order to show respect and bring some tourist dollars into Jerusalem. They would go, and then they would go on, go on to the next temple they visited. And this was a way that, that Herod's architecture accommodated a large amount of foot traffic. Uh, a lot of that foot traffic was um, Jewish. Meanwhile, pagans also show up in synagogues. Synagogues in antiquity are a combination of what we would think of as a Jewish community center, as well as a place of worship. If you look at the top of page three, um, epigraph, epig epigraphy is writing in stone, so this is again more of this um, off-trail evidence that we have. There's a Jewish inscription from Aphrodisias, a city dedicated to Aphrodite, now in Turkey. Um, that records the name, there was a, um, there was a fund drive. And um, as a result of contributing to the fund, um, people got a lovely donor plaque. And this donor plaque, which is about a ton and a half stone, records the name of, of 54 God-fearers, nine of whom are members of the town council. They list separately members of the morning minion, and they also list, there's no sisterhood listing, and they also list um, uh, converts under the title proselytoi. So converts are distinguished from God-fearers. The God-fearers are pagans, and if they're town councilors, they are public pagans, unless, given how the stone has been redated, they might be Gentile Christians but they are enough members of the synagogue community to be hit during uh, a fund, uh, how, how much of a member do you have to be to be hit during a fund drive, but in any case, they're there. We have mosaics and donor plaques attesting to pagan benefactions to synagogue communities. One of my favorites um, is A, there for A, Julia Severa, who's a high priestess in the local imperial cult. She's a priestess of the divinities of uh, the Augustan family. And she also builds a synagogue. There's a lady who's um, named Capitolina who identifies herself in this inscription as a God-fearer, uh, who's also from a prominent pagan family. And uh, there's another lady who is honored by getting her a front row seat near the bima who's also um, a serious uh, contributor. In other words, people did not have to be non-pagans to be involved in some way or other with Jewish community life and even having donor plaques and mosaic inscriptions thanking them for their benefactions as part of the synagogue architecture. And this habit of non-Jews 
dropping into Jewish synagogues um, or these JCCs continues once the, the pagans are no longer, I'm running out of vocabulary, pagan pagans, but once they're Christian pagans. Christian Gentiles continue, like pagan Gentiles, continue to drop into the synagogue, and we know this because we get very fussy bishops complaining about it, and you have uh, some of them quoted there, and church councils trying to forbid p Christians from helping their friends build Sukkot, asking the rabbi for a blessing for their field, um, or uh, fasting together with the Jewish community on Yom Kippur. So again, this is a very, a very permeable, um, very permeable society. If you go back to the bottom of the second page now, sympathizers are what God-fearers are, and there are different terms in Greek for God-fearer, but the, the point I want you to hold in your minds, please, is that a God-fearer is somebody who is a pagan, but who's showing respect for the God of Israel. In other words, he or she has added the God of Israel to whatever pantheon is native to them. They have not made an exclusive commitment. It's a, it's a some is good, more is better model. But pagans complain about this. Pagans complain about pagan God-fearing. And the problem they have about it is that it alienates, it alienates their native gods if it goes too far. So if you look at uh, pagan complaints about God-fearing, there's a famous passage in Juvenal where he complains about Roman God-fearers a father who keeps the Sabbath and no longer eats pork. Two, this is uh, another phrase for this is Judaizing. A father who just stops eating pork. He's still a pagan, but he naps one day out of every seven. What could be wrong with that? Well, what happens, says Juvenal, is he has sons who, and then I have convert and scare quotes because Juvenal doesn't actually say convert. They circumcise. They become circumcised. They spurn, and then listen to this, they spurn their own laws and they follow Jewish laws instead. The decision to what we identify as conversion, convert to Judaism, is a form of cultural treason. You, you go away from the laws that you're born into and instead you take on the, the laws of foreigners. And this is the way conversion is conceptualized. Tacitus. Uh, not a bishop, a pagan, but also grouchy in his own way. Tacitus says that uh, people who do this, the proslutoi, convert, pagan converts to Judaism, abandon the practices of the, their fathers. That's what uh, that package means. They disown their own gods, their own country, and their own family. That's how much all of this is seen as synonyms for each other. Their family, their country, and their gods are all part of a unit that is inherited by people, and these converts alienate themselves from all of that. And then uh, we have more complaints. You get, uh, you get the idea. So the hostility that we have in some pagan comments is less toward um, God-fearers than toward people who convert to Judaism. And the problem with God-fearing is that it's a slippery slope. If your dad starts taking naps one day out of every seven, remember it's a 10 day week in Roman antiquity, then what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen with the children? Okay, um, but meanwhile the God-fearers themselves are not required to make an exclusive commitment to the God of Israel and we have complaints from hostile Christian Gentile witnesses that the Jews are not trying to convert the God-fearers, but they let them co-celebrate in uh, the synagogue without putting any pressure on them to become uh, Jews. So Tertullian says um, in his treatise about on the nation, some Gentiles keep the Sabbath and Passover and continue to worship at pagan altars. And the irregularity of that offends Tertullian. And Commodian, uh, who could be either third or fifth century, we don't know, talks about 
Pagans who live between both ways, who rush from synagogue to traditional altar, and he calls them half Jews. And he adds that the Jews are wrong to tolerate such behavior. He says, he says they ought to tell you whether it's, it's good to, to worship the gods, and, but that's not happening. And Cyril of Alexandria um, also speaks about men in Phoenicia and Palestine who call themselves God-fearers and they're inconsistent in their practice. They are both pagan and yet they do some Jewish stuff at the same time. In other words, this is a form of pagan Jewish interaction or pagan Gentile interaction that exists for about a thousand years in this period. We're still getting complaints about it in the plus fifth and sixth century. So after the conversion of Constantine, after the conversion of the empire, however we want to define that, Christians and pagans are still going back and forth um, to the synagogue. With that as context, let's look at the Apostle Paul. And to do that, we're going to have to think about the type of Jew that Paul was. Paul himself says he's an A plus Jew. He's terrific. He's, this is a loose translation, uh, as to, as to, um, Righteousness under the law, I was blameless, I'm a Pharisee, I'm a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, blah, 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 and so on. He says he's terrific, but there's something else that makes Paul distinct out of um, any vague collection of, of mid-first century Jews, and that is that Paul is convinced that he knows what time it is on God's clock. Paul is expecting the kingdom of God within his lifetime, and thinking with this idea is one of the two ideas that has made the study of Paul as riotously charged as it has been since the 1980s. This is known as the new perspective on Paul. And two ideas came to historians and began to affect the way historians thought about the historical figure of Paul. The first is beginning to take his eschatology seriously. When he says he, he expects Jesus to come back and to be alive when Jesus does come back, that means he's dealing with a very condensed time frame. And the second thing that historians started paying attention to is that all of Paul's letters are directed toward pagans. None of his letters are written to Jews. That means that anything that he says about Judaism he says with respect to pagans. So with those two thoughts, how do we understand Paul's mission and message within this God-congested universe that I've constructed for you? Here are some themes of Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. Um, apocalyptic eschatology is just very elaborate Greek-based phrasing for thoughts about the imminent end of the world. Okay, and here's a list of them. How you know, you can have any collection of some of these showing up in prophetic texts that talk about the coming end of the world. Um, the righteous are usually uh, suffering. That's a clue to know that things have gone off track and God is going to intervene to put them right. Um, you can have celestial and terrest terrestrial catastrophes. There's sometimes in these texts a final battle between good and evil. And the battle can be led by God or by an angel or sometimes by a Mashiach, by an anointed king. The Dead Sea Scrolls have um, two uh, messiahs, a priestly messiah and a Davidic messiah involved in the final battle. Uh, the wicked are destroyed. That's a moment of great satisfaction in many of these writings. The dead are raised. The righteous are vindicated. There's an ingathering of the lost uh, exiles, the 10 lost tribes. Jews have a long memory. They're worried about Jews who went missing in minus 722 with uh, the Assyrian uh, captivity. There's a return to the land, a, a gathering and a rebuilt or renewed temple. Okay, here's the part that if I could have, I would have highlighted. Pagans in this scenario, so apocalyptic eschatological pagans, bury their idols and they turn and worship the God of Israel. Note, there is no apocalyptic circumcision party. These pagans do not become Jews when God's kingdom comes. As the nations, 
They destroy their idols. The idols are not the gods. The idols are the visual representations of the gods. And they, and they turn and worship the God of Israel, and then you have peace and universal acknowledgement of the God of Israel. Um, what I want to emphasize for you is that the pagans who bury their idols and make an exclusive commitment to the God of Israel are a the theoretical category. This is what the Gentiles are supposed to do when, the, when God's last put out the light is spoken. It's in Tobit uh, chapter 14. It's mistranslated as convert in the RSV um, translation of the prophet Zechariah. It's they turn. It's a, you can hear convert and turn. You can see how all these words are related, but they don't become Jews as non-Jews, as different, as different ethnic groups. They worship the God of Israel. So who is Paul's audience? They are pagans who don't worship their native gods anymore. And you have examples um, of what he says here. He says, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And he complains that they were in bondage to beings that by nature are not gods. They are lower powers, but they're not gods. What do his pagans have to do to be members in good standings of Paul's ecclesiae, his, his gatherings? And Paul says they have to abstain from sin, especially from idol worship and something that always goes together with idol worship if you're ranting about pagan culture in a Jewish context, pornea, sex and idol worship, which is go together like love and marriage, lahab deal. And, um, in these uh, texts. And he goes on, this is the will of God for your sanctification. Sanctification sits on top of a Greek word, which again sits on top of a Hebrew word, which can be understood as separation from. They've been separated out of this type of pagan culture, and they have been made separate by receiving the Holy Spirit. So they are not to worship um, they are not to worship their native gods anymore, and they are to wait for Christ to come back and not worship their gods. In other words, what Paul, and as far as we know, other members of the Jesus movement and the diaspora are doing mid-century is that they are ignoring the long-lived and socially very stable precedent of the diaspora synagogue. God-fearing is a very stable form of relating to majority culture, and it continues for centuries. But this particular Jewish movement is ignoring it and making a demand that its pagans repudiate their native gods. In other words, for the pagans whom Paul is speaking to, their salvation in Christ is provisional. And the proviso is that they must stop worshiping their own gods and only worship um, the God of Israel. This social characteristic of the new movement gets it into trouble with synagogues, with pagans, with the Roman government, and it actually, by mid-century, threatens to fracture the movement itself. We have Paul's review of the situation in Galatians because some people start saying, you know, maybe we should just turn these ex-pagan pagans into Jews, and Paul says, absolutely not. In other words, in that argument about whether to circumcise Christ-believing pagans, Paul is a traditionalist. He's going with the traditional expectations of what happens with these theoretical pagans. He is looking at his pagans, in other words, as theoretical eschatological pagans, which by his conviction, that's exactly what they are. And he sees what he thinks is a miracle. By being baptized into Christ, these pagans are in fact able to stop worshiping their own gods, and their own gods can't hurt them. But meanwhile, they're on Paul's case. Please look at the top of page four. And remember our soundbite from page one, cult makes gods happy. Happy gods make for happy humans. If gods don't get cult, they're not happy. And if a god is unhappy, humans pay. 
So Paul complains again that the God of this age has blinded uh, the minds of unbelievers. I'm sorry about the Greek. It's not important because the, um, the English came out fine. He says that the rulers of this age have crucified the son of Paul's God. The rulers of this age is a normal way of referring to the celestial and planetary powers of the lower gods of the cosmos. They're known as the, or the keepers of the gate, the rulers of this age, and so on. He says that they are not cosmic, they are not gods by nature, but they're cosmic lightweights. The word he uses is stoicheia. They're just these elemental forces in the universe. They're not, they're not uh, like the God of Israel. And he calls such gods daimones, just like Psalm 95 did, they're lower gods. He says that there are many gods, but they're not for his people. And he soon promises that these lower cosmic powers, this is 1 Corinthians 15, are about to be defeated by Christ when Christ returns to establish the kingdom of his father. How is Christ gonna do this? And in 1 Thessalonians, we get a description. When Jesus returns, he'll appear the way that a campaigning Messiah should appear with the cry of command and the trumpet sounding and the commanding angelic forces and raising the dead. And when Christ comes back to do all this, that's when these pagan gods will themselves be defeated. He alludes to this in um, Philippians chapter two, when he talks about how all knees will bend to the name of Jesus, knees above the earth and on the earth and below the earth. It's a lot of knees. Right, those not human knees he's referring to. So the, the gods of the nations will themselves acknowledge through Jesus, acknowledge the God of Israel. And meanwhile, by being in Christ, the last point in that package, Paul's pagans are spared two kinds of divine wrath. That of their own gods who can't hurt them because they're, they're in this special zone protected by Christ and uh, they're spared the wrath of the God of Israel, which, quote, is coming, Paul says, in Thessalonians. And what is everybody waiting for? I'll, because I only have a few more minutes, I'll skip that paragraph. You can read it yourself. This is Paul's eschatology, his description of what is about to happen and how soon it's going to happen. The last thing he says in his last letter, Romans, you know how late the hour is. Salvation, by which he means the second coming of Christ. Salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. That's just the background. Now I want to get to the point I wanted to make about the lecture, but I'll do it very quickly. What conclusions can we draw from this uh, picture that I presented? First of all, if, you, if there was one idea that I, I would like you to take home with you, is that while Jewish, Jews in Hellenistic culture were distinct and distinctive, they were also extremely well integrated into Hellenistic culture. They couldn't have had the facility with Greek, they couldn't have had some of them like Philo and Paul also has a good Greek education. In order to get that, the only place in town to get that is the gymnasium and the gymnasium is itself dedicated to Greek gods. So there's a kind of neighborly relationship, not only with pagans, but with their gods as well, that is a characteristic of Hellenistic Jewish society, which draws lines. They draw a line at public cult, but there are also other ways of acknowledging and showing respect, um, and they do that. Um, Okay, the second, the second thing is that with Paul's idea and with as far as we know, except for the people who want to start circumcising, the, gent, the Christians who, Christian Jews who want to start circumcising Christian pagans, pagans are integrated into Israel's coming redemption. This is the message of Paul. Israel is going to be redeemed, and if you look at the, uh, the bottom section of the fourth page, you can see the passages that I've excerpted for you from Romans. Israel is going to be redeemed. In fact, it's an unnatural act. God is actually working a miracle, making Israel not become, uh, not realize that Paul is right about how to read the Bible. And once God stops hardening Israel's heart, 
Israel will realize that, but that's what it took so that there'll be extra time to get to all these pagans who are outlying. But the point is that pagans are going to be integrated into Israel's coming redemption, which again makes Paul something of a traditional Jewish um, apocalypticist with this, this interesting um, wrinkle because of the particular connection with the second coming of Christ. Um, a third point I'd like to uh, raise is that the temple remains absolutely central for Paul. He uses the language of holiness and purity of his Gentiles being made suitable to be brought close to the, the temple of God and to be an offering that Paul can make to God. In other words, he's using temple language and the criteria for a pure offering in the temple as a way to conceptualize how he's bringing his pagans into the movement. It's something far from, in other words, disowning the temple or replacing the temple. It's the probity and the dignity and the importance of the temple protocols that give him his overarching metaphor for how to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing by enabling these pagans not to uh, worship their own gods anymore. And finally, and this really is my finally, finally, and I'll conclude on this point almost exactly on time. Finally, I want to argue that we should see clearly what Paul is asking of his pagans and what, for all we know, absolutely all of the apostles in the early years of this new apocalyptic Jewish messianic movement are asking of their pagan followers. And what they are all demanding is no Lytreia, no cult to native gods. This is not an ethical demand so much as it is a ritual demand. No cult to their native gods. More than this, it's specifically a Judaizing demand. It's asking these pagans who remain different ethnicities and, and members of different families in a sense, to act in this way, to act out exactly the way that majority culture and Jews as well associated universally and exclusively with Jews. Only Jews were described as not worshiping um, native, the gods of majority culture, and Paul and the other apostles are making the same demand of their uh, pagans. Born Jews had been the occasional object of pagan resentment because of this behavior. Proselytes, what we call converts to Judaism, were that much more the objects of uh, derision and disapproval. But when fellow pagans in large numbers also began to disrespect the gods, this went too far, and the gods' people struck back. It's from this population, the deviant pagans of the Jesus movement, that the martyrs eventually will come. In other words, Paul's insistence that none other than the God of Israel be worshiped is something that ultimately comes from the first table of the Torah, from the first table of the law. No other gods. This demand was absolutely defining. In terms of what Paul says to his pagans in the letters we have from him, it was non-negotiable. And as a kind of behavior, it was uniquely Jewish. So for all of the reasons I've sprinted through and tried to present to you tonight, but especially for this last one, I think the last way we should describe Paul's gospel to the Gentiles is to say that it was law-free. Thank you. <laughs>